Dr. Gloria Betcher is a teaching professor in the Department of English at Iowa State University. She has lived in Ames for 30 years and has embraced the city as her home, so much so that she has served on the Ames City Council since 2014, representing the First Ward. Prior to that, she chaired the Ames Historic Preservation Commission for seven years and worked on the nomination for downtown Ames to be placed on the National Register of Historic Places. As a historic preservation consultant and an avid genealogist, she has come to know the city and its people as only an enthusiastic transplant can, without the burden of past association, family lore, and historic prejudices that all of us seem prone to when looking at places and people that we've known for years. In 2014, for the city's sesquicentennial, Gloria and her husband, Professor Doug, uh, Doug Biggs, wrote the book Ames, which was published in the Arcadia Press Images of America series. A, medi a medievalist by training with an MA and PhD from the University of Minnesota, Gloria is currently heading a team of researchers to produce a project for the Iowa State University Tracing Race Initiative. That project, focused on the Black Iowa State College student experience up until 1950, is the foundation for the presentation that she will share with you tonight. Please welcome Gloria. Uh, can we make sure that this microphone is off? Got it? Great. Well, I'm so glad to see so many people here tonight. Uh, I hope you didn't come to hear me talk mostly about Jack Trice, because this is about the people around Jack Trice. I will give you some on Jack and Cora May, but I am not an expert on Jack by any means. And I'll direct you to Dr. Jonathan Gelber's new book, The Idealist on Jack's life. Uh, I think that that covers it quite well and also brings him up into the present day. So before we get started, I'd just like to uh, recognize the previous stewardship of this land with a land acknowledgement. Iowa State University and the city of Ames are located on the ancestral lands and territory of the Bacoche or Iowa Nation. The United States obtained the land from the Meskwaki and Sauk Nations in the Treaty of 1842, and I wish to recognize our obligations to this land and to the, the people who took care of it as well as to the 17,000 Native people who live in Iowa today. So Kathy mentioned that this project, this presentation, is based on information that comes from research that's been completed for the Tracing Race Initiative at Iowa State. And for some reason, this skipped over that slide. I guess I'm not too skilled with this particular clicker. The Tracing Race Initiative is a library-led initiative to encourage and support digital scholarship. It centers the history, experiences, and achievements of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color at Iowa State University, and it engages with the history of race, racism, and student, faculty, and staff activism. My team's project covers the Black ISC student experience to 1950. And that project involves identifying all the Black students who attended Iowa State between 1891 and 1950, writing a biography for each student, and locating the Ames residences of those Black students. Now, the project started with two very simple research questions. Where did Black students live off campus before they were able to easily live on campus? And who supported their efforts to find housing in Ames? So for those of you who aren't aware of the situation for housing, Black students, by unwritten rule, were not allowed to live on campus at the college until well into the 1940s. When housing director Schilleter was interviewed, he said that he thought he recalled that the first approval he gave for a black student to live on campus with a white student didn't come until 1947. And yet, as many of you know, 
there were Black students attending Iowa State College all the way back to George Washington Carver, our first African-American student. So officially, Black students were treated just like foreign students, many of whom were also not white, which administrators seemed to think was fair enough treatment. In a letter dated June 17, 1910, then Iowa State President A.B. Storms assured civil rights activist and co-founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, W.E.B. Du Bois, that, quote, Negro students are entirely welcome in this institution, that is Iowa State. They have no discourtesy whatever shown them by fellow students or others, unquote. He continued his letter saying that, quote, it is not always easy for a Negro student to find rooming and boarding accommodations except where there are enough to room and board together, as is the case with the Filipinos and with students of other nationalities, unquote. Now, you might recognize the problem here. Take, for example, George Washington Carver, the only African-American student on campus, how do you find someone else of the same color to room with? This situation continued up until 1947. And while the number of African-American students increased, the policy remained the same. So Black students had to be housed somewhere, and our project sought to find out where they were living, because they clearly were not living on campus. The project so far has answered those questions, and we've also cataloged all the Black students that could be identified. Oops, sorry. I'm trying to fix this down. Oh, okay. oh we've got issues. Okay. You can read the slide while we're fixing the issues. Thank you. It's so nice to have a technology team. I don't have to worry about this. When I'm teaching my classes, I am the technology team. So, so far, we have cataloged all the Black students that we've been able to identify, which is 112 of them. But that number continues to grow as we find more and more references to additional students. And while many of you might have thought that there really were only two Black students at Iowa State, George Washington Carver and Jack Trice, there are many more students who came to Iowa State, especially coming up from the South in the early decades of the 20th century. So we've been producing biographies for all of the students that we can find. We have been locating and linking their Iowa State College theses and dissertations to those biographies if the students were seeking MS degrees or PhD degrees. And we were writing sidelight stories on student life and being Black in Ames. That is a continuing project. We haven't gotten there yet. So Jack Trice is one of those students. And this presentation focuses on his family, his friends, and his classmates, who are more than just one or two people. If you look at this collage, you may be familiar with the photo of Jack in his football gear. You may be less familiar with the headshot that appears on this slide. That's a headshot from a group photo of Jack's fraternity, Alpha Nu chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha. And in the background, we have a photo of what has become known as Jack's last letter. So, much of Jack's short time in Ames and at Iowa State College has recently been explored by Dr. Gelber, as I mentioned, in his 2022 book, The Idealist, Jack Trice, and the Battle for a Forgotten Football Legacy. Gelber recounts Jack's arrival in Ames and on the ISC campus and paints, oh, hi, wait a minute, I won't tell you what he paints until the tech team comes in. Okay, so Gelber paints a relatively grim picture of race relations in Ames. And 
the treatment of African American students in this predominantly white community does not come off well. To be sure, Ames had its share of racism, bigotry, and even a Ku Klux Klan uh, Legal, I guess it's the Klegal of Story County, um, when Jack was here in 1922 and 1923. But much of what has been written about that history centers the actions and the sentiments of the white community and how they impacted uh, Jack and other Black residents. In other words, focuses on the response and the white community creating a hostile environment. It doesn't focus on the thriving of the African-American students and other African-American residents in this community. So there's been less done to center the African-American community of Ames and Jack's interactions with his black classmates and friends. After devoting an entire chapter to Cora Mae Starland, the future Mrs. Trice, Gelber in broad strokes paints an impressionist version of Jack's associates, hitting those individuals who left a more easily traceable track across history's pages. My intent is to add some detail to Gelber's portraits, highlight some individuals who led less prominent lives, and speculate on some reasons Jack may have developed a connection to those individuals. So John, G. Jack Trice was born the 12th of May, 1902 in Hiram, Ohio to Tr Green Trice, a farmer, and Anna W. Trice. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Jack's early life, but he was a standout football player at East High School in Cleveland. And then in 1921, when he was a junior or just finishing his junior year, he spent the summer in Ravenna, Ohio and encountered Cora Mae Starland before returning in fall 1921 to Cleveland to finish his senior year at East Tech High. After Jack's graduation in spring 1922, he moved to Ravenna and spent time with his mother and Cora Mae. I believe he was an auto mechanic at the time working to earn money to come to Iowa State. Well, actually, he didn't know at the time he was going to come to Iowa State. I'm getting ahead of myself. So. Cora Mae Starland, who you can see here in her graduation photo, was born in Denver, Colorado, the daughter of Alberta R. Little Starland and Samuel W. Starland. The exact year of Cora Mae's birth is unclear, as different documents list her birth as different dates. One document, her death record, says she was born 19 February 1907. Her marriage certificate says she was 19 when she got married, which makes her born in 1903. And uh, the 1930 census has her born around 1910. Given that she graduated from high school, and Alex Schaefer from the History Museum has confirmed that she appears on the graduation roll for Ravenna High in 1919, it's unlikely that she was born in 1910. And it's even unlikely that she was born in 1907. So I'm guessing 1903 is the date we should be looking at for Cora. And she was 15 when she graduated. So even I can do that math. I think it works. The Starlins moved their family to Ravenna, Ohio, shortly before they divorced. And Alberta remarried to Claude Curtis. Cora May graduated from Ravenna High School in July 1919, having kept her original birth name, Starland, and began to work at the Anavar Mill, a woolen mill locally that summer. And there, when she was putting in her 12-hour shifts working at the mill, she met Anna Trice, mother of Jack. Jack came to Ravenna that summer he met Cora May through Anna. And at the same time, as summer passed, he learned from his former high school coach, Sam Williman, that Williman was going to be taking a job at Iowa State College coaching the football team. And he invited Jack to come to Iowa State. Since a mentor uh, and friendly friend of Cora May's, a Dr. Pugh, had been associated with the Agricultural College 
he felt that it would be a good place to continue his research or his studies, I should say, because research is a little bit elevated for what someone coming out of high school is going to be doing when they enter college. When Jack entered Iowa State College in January 1922, he was enrolled in a two-year non-collegiate agriculture program so that he could obtain the necessary credits in missing preparatory coursework before beginning the animal husbandry degree program. And that was not uncommon. Many students, including white graduates of Ames High School, had to go through the two-year preparatory courses at Iowa State College. Jack was successful in those preparatory classes, and he attained his goal in the summer of 1923, being admitted to the program in animal husbandry after a strong performance in those preparatory courses. He was active at Iowa State College in the Alpha Nu chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha in 1923, belonging alongside a number of people that we're going to meet shortly. So when Jack left Iowa State for the summer of 1923 and he returned to Ravenna, there was Cora. She was going to be coming back with him. The couple had married in the summer of 1922 before Jack left for college. That's where that marriage certificate date came from. And they'd married on July 27th in Monroe, Michigan so that they could get a quick marriage in. They, there wasn't a waiting period in Michigan at that time. And when Jack left for Iowa State College, according to Gelber, Cora May stipulated that before she was willing to join him at Iowa State, he had to arrange for them to have housing together. Well, we've already seen the difficulty of having Black students living on campus. Imagine a Black student couple trying to find housing on campus. So Jack was motivated to find housing where he and Cora May could live when she came to Ames. And he arranged for housing in the Masonic Temple Building, which is just across the street here on the corner of Fifth Street and Douglas Avenue. So these maps that I'll occasionally throw in here are from our project where we have mapped where students lived. And that is the location of the apartment in the Masonic building that Jack acquired by fall of 1923. The Iowa State Directory indicates that that was the first quarter that Jack had lived off campus on his own. And Dr. Gelber asserts that he was living with his high school friends and teammates, Norton Baim and Champ Hardy in Campus Town before that. Unfortunately, I can't tell you where that was because they don't appear in the Iowa State Directory listed together in that 1922 year. Now, it'd be easy for me, and, and I guess I'm an English professor, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell you a story. It's easy for me to imagine that the reason Jack Trice ended up living in the Masonic Temple Building is that he had connected to one of Ames' leading African-American citizens. Walter Madison was a 1914 graduate of Iowa State's College or Division of Engineering and a scion of an early Black family in Ames. And he was the first Black Iowa State college students to put down roots here after he graduated. He came to Ames sometime after he graduated from Tuskegee in 1909 and before the census of 1910, because he's listed as being employed at the Iowa State College President's residence in 1910. Working as a laborer, no doubt to earn the money to actually fund his college education. Walter was born in Manor, Texas in 1888, and he'd left his parents and his eight brothers and sisters behind to seek higher education, first at Tuskegee, then at Iowa State College. And he'd received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering and become 
a what we would call today probably an HVAC expert. He opened a plumbing and heating business here in Ames and became a prominent businessman. His marriage to Gussie Irene Askew occurred in Cook County, Illinois in 1917, and the two later moved into a house at 1204 3rd Street. That house is still there today. They had four sons, Walter Jr., Archie, Horace, and Ira. And the Madisons became one of the leading Black families in Ames, with Walter operating a successful plumbing and heating company. And throughout this time, Walter developed what became, I think, a well-known voice in the community for strident yet respectful and equitable treatment of his race. He lobbied for fair treatment of Black residents in Ames. Like Nancy and Archie Martin, progenitors of the best-known Black family in Ames. Whoops, that's not them. Where did they go? I'll, I'll find them for you. There they are. This is what happens when you start retooling your presentation at 5.30. <laughs> so Archie and Nancy Martin, um, as far as we know, did not house Jack Trice. They did, however, open their house to many, many African-American students. <clears throat> And they were among the first African-American families in Ames, arriving sometime between 1913 and 1916. And they were known for their support of the students on campus. So if there were African-American students studying at Iowa State, somehow they would find their way into the community the Black community in Ames, and Archie and Nancy were among the leaders of that community as one of the um, older families to come to Ames. Having been born into slavery, they knew what hardship meant, and the family oral histories of their lives and their lives of their daughter Nellie and her husband John Ship also indicate that the Martin and Ship families understood all too well how important a supportive community was in creating success for Black students and other members of the local Black community. Indeed, the Black community didn't count on their white neighbors to come through to their aid when times were tough. They counted on each other. When we think about Walter Madison and his wife, Gussie, opening their home to student residents like Archie and Nancy did, in 1926, it's hard for me not to create the connection between Jack Trice getting help to find an apartment in the Masonic building and Walter Madison's generosity in opening his home to Iowa State students only three years after Jack found housing at the Masonic Temple. It seems to me likely that Madison had something to do with finding Jack housing and that he was committed to supporting African-American students. And probably as soon as the kids were old enough, opened the house to having students reside there between 1926 and 1941. So I did mention the Alpha New chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha. These are Jack's fraternity brothers, and I did not label everyone up here because the uh, four gentlemen who are not labeled went to Drake. This was a joint fraternity, and so because I'm focusing on the Ames community, I'm going to leave them aside, but they also are very interesting and prominent members of society after they graduate. We're going to come back to these fraternity brothers soon. <clears throat> but these fraternity brothers were among the most devastated by Jack's experience, by his death, I should say, at the hands of a football player from the University of Minnesota. <coughs> I'm sorry, I think I need some water.
<clears throat> so when Jack was injured in the football game against the University of Minnesota on October 6th, I believe it was, ooh, I'm, now I'm flashing back, it might have been the 5th. He came back to Iowa State and died on October 8th. At that time, <clears throat> Cora May was summoned to his bedside and fraternity brother Harold Tut brought her to Jack where she had her last confrontation with her husband. Um, in a letter from 1987, she said that she found her husband on the edge of death and recalled, I said, hello, darling. He looked at me, but never spoke. I remember hearing the campanile chime three o'clock. That was October 8th, 1923, and he was gone. In fall 1923, Trace's transcript notes that he dropped his 15 and one third credits of coursework on October 9th, 1923. And obviously what that transcript note doesn't say is that Trice's credits were dropped because Jack, an athletic standout and the first African-American member of the Iowa State football squad had died the day before. The tragedy of this event is compounded We'll go back to Alpha Nu. It's compounded by the aspirations and pride expressed by Trice's fraternity brothers. Brother A.C. Aldridge, writing for the fraternity's journal, The Sphinx, in June of 1923, only months before Trice's death, praised Trice's abilities as an all-around athlete and his potential to be one of the athletic greats. Quote, among the new brothers that have filled the ranks of Alpha Nu is Brother John Trice, who is destined to reach great heights in the athletic world. Winning his numerals in football last fall did not satisfy Brother Trice. This spring, his work on the prep track squad was a revelation to the most keen fans of that sport. He has frequently thrown the discus 135 feet and passing the 40-foot mark with the shot seems to be an easy matter for him. Trice has not only shown ability on the track and gridiron, but his aquatic habits have obtained for him membership at the Iowa State College Life Saving Corps. Indeed, Jack had won the shot put event in the Missouri Valley Conference meet as a freshman in 1922. He'd also been a solid academic performer with average grades of 93, according to his memorial written for the Sphinx by Alpha Phi Alpha brother Harold Tutt. But it, I think his grades are slightly lower, according to his transcript. Still an excellent student and one that I would be happy to have in any of my classes. I was gratified to see he'd taken English. Jack's memorial service on Central Campus at Iowa State College on the 9th of October, 1923, was attended by several thousand people, according to news reports. That's no small number when you consider there were only slightly over 3,000 students on campus at the time. The African-American community of Ames held its own memorial service. Organized by Jack's fraternity brothers on Sunday, October 21st at the home of Mr. and Mrs. E.H. Gator. The Gator home at 1125 Kellogg Avenue still stands in one of Ames' most established neighborhoods not far from the home of M.D. Lowry and his family at 220 11th Street. The Gators and the Lowrys built their homes there, two African-American families in a white community. And Nellie Ship recalled that no one objected to having Blacks in their neighborhood. The Gators became well-known in the community. Edwin was a porter with the CNNW Railroad, owner of Gator Shoeshine Parlor, and a waiter at the Hotel Sheldon Munn. And Mrs. Gator, formerly Myra McCracken, was well connected through her family to black society circles in Des Moines and Minneapolis. I wish I had a photo of Myra McCracken Gator because I imagine her to be a very formidable woman who is very proud of her connections to society. 
if I found the photo, I'll probably find out she was a tiny woman who was not at all prepossessing in, in her appearance. That's one thing this project has taught me. Never assume anything about what the people you're reading about will look like. Myra, excuse me, Myra Gator frequently appeared in the society columns of the Ames newspapers and the Iowa State Bystander, the African-American newspaper based in Des Moines. And as she traveled to see friends and family, hosted parties and events and opened her home to visitors, all of Iowa Black society heard about it. More notably, the Gators opened their home for the Black Community's Memorial Service for Jack in October of 1923. Among other tributes at that somber event, M.D. Lowry read Trice's final letter. And after the service, which included music, memorial speeches, and a report on the memorial service held at Iowa State, a collection was taken for Trice's mother and widow. The newspaper noted that every Negro in the city made a contribution toward the fund. The money collected at each memorial service, both on campus and the one at the Gator home, helped to cover funeral expenses and to transport Jack's body back to Ohio, as well as to pay for Anna Trice's mortgage. Following Jack's memorial service on campus, Cora May and Jack's mother Anna traveled with a funeral party, including brother Harold Tutt, back to Ohio to bury Jack in Hiram. And I think I'm gonna go back. We'll put this up here. Harold Tut is up, up here in the upper left corner. Harold Lindsay Tut was born on the 10th of December, 1903 to Ryle and Minnie Tut in Higby, Missouri. He was a member of Alpha Nu Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha while at Iowa State College. And he was a fraternity brother of Jack Trice. At the start of October, 1923, Tut was the newly appointed Alpha Nu Chapter correspondent to the Sphinx, the fraternity magazine, looking forward to a banner year unsuspecting of the tragedy in the coming weeks. The death of Brother Trice on October 8th of that year caused a ripple of sympathy and sadness through the ranks of Alpha Nu, and Harold reported it. He also alerted Cora to the dire health of her injured husband, joined the funeral party that accompanied Jack's remains to Hiram, Ohio for burial, helped to organize the program for the African American Community's Memorial Service at the home of Mr. and Mrs. E.H. Gator, and reported to those assembled on the Campus Memorial Service and the Ohio Burial Service. One of the interesting things about Harold Tutt, or interesting to me, maybe I have an odd sense of what's interesting, is that when Harold was living in Ames, he was only here from 1923 to 1925. He didn't complete his degree at Iowa State. He was living in Campus Town, and one of his housemates was a man named Holloway Smith. Some of you may have heard of Holloway Smith. He was the second African-American varsity football player at Iowa State College. Harold Tutt was a physical education major, and so he was interested in sport, and that was a lifetime pursuit of his. After leaving Iowa State College, he traveled a bit. He was out in Berkeley. He was in Detroit. He was in Lansing. We know about that because he shows up in the Sphinx and he's reported to be active in the various chapters of Alpha Phi Alpha. He never completed his degree because of the tragic death of his fiance, which apparently threw him off his game. And so he, he didn't complete the degree, but he continued working in the academic environment in Lansing, Michigan where of course Michigan State is located. And in Lansing, he worked as a porter in two barber shops and was well known in the community for his tutoring of African-American youths at the college and his coaching of the Lincoln Community Center sports teams in basketball, softball, and baseball, among others. And as the Lansing, Journal, Lansing State Journal reported upon his death, 
quote, Harold Lindsay Tut became known as a gentleman's gentleman and earned the affection of all races and creeds, unquote. When he passed away on the 15th of April, 1951, at St. Lawrence Hospital in Lansing, Michigan, his death was mourned by many members of the Lansing community, black and white alike, because Tut was such a likable man. By 1924, Cora May, who you may remember had returned to Ravenna after Jack's death, had moved back in with her mother and stepfather in Youngstown, Ohio. She'd left Iowa State College without completing her degree in home economics, though she did return to Ames and is listed in the 1925 Iowa Census as residing with the Edwin Gator family, the people who hosted Jack's memorial service. Awareness of the need for support of Black residents by Black residents no doubt spurred the formation of the Mutual Aid Club in March of 1918. And Myra McCracken Gator was one of the primary members in the Mutual Aid Club, along with Ollie Lowry, who was Moses Lowry's wife. And that club was there to support the students as well as other residents, Black residents in the community. Remember I said that they didn't count on the white community to do anything for them. On the screen here, you can see a quotation from Willa Juanita Ewing, who I'm going to be referring to as Juanita because that was what her family called her. Willa Juanita Ewing was the first African-American graduate of Ames High School and the first African-American woman to receive a master's degree at Iowa State College. And she happened to be there at the same time as Jack Trice. She graduated from Ames High in 1922. Writing back to the horticulture program in 1937, when Ewing was down in Alabama, she said, at Ames, what few colored people live there are apt to think 30 or 40 colored students coming there to school are an awfully lot of people. Those 40 or even 50 that come during the summer represent just a pitifully lucky few compared to the thousands and thousands here at their own schools. Now, what's interesting to me about this quotation, not so much that there are so many African-American students in the South who don't have the opportunities that the students in the North do, but that she's observing that 40 to 50 students may be coming to Iowa State College from the South every year. And yet we don't know who they were. We have very few records of who these students were other than registrar's records. Many of them came for summer coursework and this photo at the top here is a photo of a summer botany course, which my team was thrilled to find because among that group, there are three African-American students, which is an incredibly high percentage of African-American students in a class at Iowa State College in 1926. When Willa Ewing or one, Willow Anita Ewing graduated in 1926. The crisis, the NAACP journal noted that there were 13 African-American students at Iowa State College in 1926. I believe there were more, but we may never know who they are. In 1911, not long after the Gators' arrival in Ames, Edwin H. Carter, his wife, Lee Juanita, and their daughter, Willa Juanita, moved here from Des Moines. Lee Juanita, known as Lee at age 23, had already been married to a, in Missouri to a man named William Ewing. By 1915, the Carter family had moved to Ames, and by the 1920 census, Juanita Carter was enumerated as a widow, a housekeeper at the Tridelt House with a daughter named Juanita now age 16. And by 1925, Lee had married for a third time to a man of mixed race from Boone, Iowa, named Charles A. Anthony. His daughter appears in the 1925 census as 
Anthony's stepdaughter, Juanita Ewing. By that time, Lee's daughter had completed two years at Iowa State College. And she may be familiar to some of you because her face appeared on the banner that was, was hanging on the side of the History Museum for the last year or so. And I already gave you the account of, of her educational record, but she is the first African-American woman to receive a bachelor's of science in botany in 1926, as well as the first to receive her MA in 1935. She left town to take up a position of the, as the head of the biology department at Alabama State Teachers College, now Alabama State University. During her undergraduate years in the 1920s, Juanita lived with her parents at the home they owned at 2928 Wood Street. It was then called Woodman Street. And the family made money during the depression by renting the house on Wood Street to black Iowa State College students for several years after 1930, during which time the family moved into the Phi Gamma Delta fraternity house where Lee was a cook. So the Gators, the Martins, Walter Madison, and the Anthonys slash Carters slash Ewings, maybe it's easier to just call them the Ewings, although Juanita is the only one whose name is Ewing at this point, um, arrived before or at the very start of the Great Migration. So they're, they're very early in arriving in Ames, pre-1916, and yet um, they are not as well known as they should be given their prominence within the Black community. The Black families of Ames no doubt were hoping to find better economic opportunities and fewer Jim Crow policies in this northern college town than in the southern states they'd left. They may have been surprised to find that de facto segregation and overt racism existed, despite the abolitionist sentiment that Farwell Brown noted among the eastern founders of Ames. Bringing to light and fighting against racist attitudes and policies seems to have become a crusade for Walter Madison, as I mentioned. All members of the small black community in Ames in the early 20th century knew Walter. He was an eloquent, educated man who used his pen to highlight injustice by publishing opinion pieces in the Ames paper. Madison catalogs the triumphs and contributions of the black race and endeavors throughout history and makes the following poignant assessment of the situation of black Americans in 1915. The Negro has succeeded in every line of endeavor into which he has gained admission. We need respect, pure, simple respect, not an abstract something unmerited, but due recognition of our status and the things that measure men. It is not fair that we should have our rights and privileges abridged to the extent of embarrassment and inconvenience. It is not fair that we frequently cannot rent a room in an ordinary hotel where just ordinary men happen to be. It is not just that we can often cannot expect employment in a factory or industrial system, including the government enterprises, where just ordinary men are employed. In closing, Madison argues that individuals, not races, exhibit both good and bad characteristics, and that all races have, are made up of individuals of varying character. As I read this, I think about Jack Trice and Cora May coming to Ames, trying to fit in, trying to find their way in a white community. Similar sentiments are voiced by another Black Ames resident, Moses Lowry, a few years later in a letter to the editor of the Ames Daily Tribune and Evening Times. Lowry makes clear that race relations in the community had turned for the worse in recent months in 1919. Much of what Laurie writes echoes Madison's sentiments in theme, if not in actual words and phrases. He too loves his community and believes it can do better for its black residents. Laurie, a tailor with a successful downtown business and a wife, Ollie, who was president of the new mutual aid club, had brought their family to Ames in 1916. His standing within the Ames business community like that of Walter Madison allowed him to speak more freely about the injustices he encountered. In Ames, those negative race relations included anti-Black sentiment that emerged in the community in a number of ways from the early 1920s until the 1950s. 
On February 1st, 1922, for example, John Siagres, proprietor of the New London Restaurant, denied service to a Black man wishing to dine at that restaurant. That Black man happened to be Walter Madison. And we've seen that he was an outspoken advocate for racial justice. Madison sued Siagres for $5,000 in damages, which is quite a sum in 1920. And he won the case but he was only awarded $100 and the moral victory. Jack and Cora Mae Trice would likely have had limited exposure to this notoriously racist restaurant because it was sold at the sheriff's sale before the end of 1923. The Martins, the Madisons, the Gators, and the Lowrys, among other Black families and Ames, helped to fill not only the need for Black student housing off campus, but also other basic needs. Ensuring that Black ISC students like Jack succeeded and made uh, members, they made members of the, excuse me, they made members of their small black community proud was essential in a primarily white town where anyone of color would come under scrutiny. Still, when interviewed by Ames historian Farwell Brown in 1985, 93-year-old Nellie Ship recalled that once black and white neighbors got to know each other, race became less important than shared experience, particularly the experience of poverty and hard times. So while Jack and Cora might have experienced some difficulties when they came to Ames, they were supported. So sorry, I was warned about this clicker. It's, it's not not intuitive. One of Jack Trice's fraternity brothers was a man named Frederick Patterson. Frederick Patterson is uh, an astounding Iowa State alumnus, and he was also a member of Jack's fraternity and a friend. In his 1991 autobiography, Patterson recounted the living experience that he had as part of what was came to be called the Interstate Club. I joined a group of six or seven other black students and we rented the upstairs floor over a 10 cent store in the town of Ames, a mile or so from campus. We had a kitchen, a front room, and a very large room in the rear for sleeping. We just lined up beds in that large room and lived as though we were in an army barracks. And you can imagine that in, say, 1921, that probably worked pretty well because a number of the men who lived in this apartment actually had served in World War I. So this was much better than the accommodations they had when fighting in France. However, I must say, as a member of the city council, I cannot condone <laughs> the stacking of students in this sort of living situation. It's not safe. But it was economical. And the rent, which I believe was $16 a month, was shared among all of the residents. Jesse Otis, who was another person who lived at the apartment, recounted that sometimes there'd be as many as 20 people in this apartment, which really lowered the rent cost per person. And still some of the students had to take a quarter off from their education to earn money to return to Iowa State College, which charged at this time, I believe it was $14 a quarter. So when you look at the records of many of these students, they take much longer to graduate because they take time off to earn money and then they return to school. The Interstate Club lived in what is now known as the Elliott Building at 226 Main Street. And the apartment above the 226 commercial front at 226 and a half was the home of the Interstate Club. They called themselves this because the students were from a variety of different states. The residents included a number of brothers of Jack Trice from the Alpha Nu chapter of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. And these gentlemen that you see on the screen, J. Herman Banning, Rufus Atwood, Frederick Patterson, Jesse Otis, Lawrence Potts, John Lockett, Aubrey Aldridge, John 
no, sorry, Cal Bibb, James Fraser and Compton Chapman were the ones who were there at the time that Jack was living nearby at the Masonic building. Now you remember the Masonic temple is the, the building at the top. If I can get this. I was so excited to have a laser pointer and it just isn't working for me. Oh, well. Up in the top, we have the Masonic temple where Jack and Cora were residing in 1923. And on Main Street at 226, we have the Interstate Club, which is just literally down the block and around the corner. So it wasn't that they were separated from each other, that they um, didn't feel a sense of community living downtown. All of these pins indicate places where African-American Iowa State College students resided in downtown Ames. So they had a sense of community in the downtown. I wanna tell you something about these men. These men provided much of the support system for Jack as brothers in the Alpha Nu chapter of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Now, not all of them were in that. Let's see if I can go back fast enough. I don't know if I can. Oops. So here we have. How many is that? Six, eight, nine. So almost all of the residents were in Alpha Nu chapter at the time. The outlier is Compton Chapman, who joined Alpha Phi Alpha the year after Jack died. These men were an interesting group. There were four men there who studied engineering. Compton Chapman, over there on the right, was the only civil engineer. The others were electrical engineers. Among them, if let's say, well, actually, let me draw the connection for you first. While Jack was not studying engineering, you might recall he was employed as an auto mechanic, earning money. I imagine Jack getting together with his friends, talking about cars, maybe even working on the rattle trap truck that Frederick Patterson and Jesse Otis used to pick up carpets for their carpet cleaning service. The truck apparently was always breaking down and Patterson and Otis had to work on it constantly with uh, Jimmy Fraser living with them and Herman Banning who had opened his own uh, auto repair shop in town. They were in good hands. You'd think that this group of guys could keep an old truck going. Jack would have had an understanding of what it takes to be a good mechanic. He would have been in that um, milieu with these other students. So who are they? Some of you may have heard of James Herman Banning. He was another student who was featured on the banner that the History Museum had on their wall and also featured in the exhibit inside uh, with the photo opportunity to have your picture taken in his plane, the Miss Ames. He also happens to be the lucky recipient of the honor of having the Ames Municipal Airport renamed after him. The James Herman Banning Ames Municipal Airport will have a ribbon cutting this summer, we hope, in conjunction with the Juneteenth celebration. Herman came from Oklahoma. He was born the 5th of November, 1899 in Canton, Oklahoma Territory, the last of four children born to Riley Banning and his wife, Cora Woods Banning. After moving to Ames in 1919 to attend Iowa State College, and by the way, his parents moved with him, um, he studied electrical engineering, but he left Iowa State in 1924 because he had caught the flying bug. Um, like many of his classmates, he worked while attending school and after leaving Iowa State, 
To pursue his dream of becoming a pilot, he continued operating the J.H. Banning Auto Repair Shop, which he had started in 1922. The shop closed in 1928. He caught that flying bug in 1920 and took flying lessons in Des Moines. He became the first black aviator to receive a federal pilot's license and the first black pilot to complete a transcontinental flight across the US. During his time in college, Banning also lived for a number of semesters at the Interstate Club with these gentlemen. While he lived there, he met fellow Interstate Club resident, Frederick D. Patterson. Patterson later wrote about seeing Banning fly when he lived in Iowa, and the first time, that was the first time Patterson had seen a black aviator. This inspiration, along with the likes of black aviator Bessie Coleman and others, encouraged Patterson to see the potential for a commercial aviation program at Tuskegee Institute, where he had become president in 1935. This was the program that produced the famed Tuskegee Airmen of World War II, inspired by Herman Banning. Banning left Iowa in 1929 to take a job in Los Angeles at the Bessie Coleman Flying School. And while he was there, he purchased his biplane, christened Miss Ames. A few years later, from 18th of September to the 9th of October, 1932, Banning and co-pilot Thomas Cox Allen completed a coast-to-coast -coast flight from Los Angeles to New York City that secured for these so-called flying hobos the distinction of being the first African Americans to complete a transcontinental flight. Only a few months later, on the 5th of February 1933, Banning died in an air crash, age 33, during an air show in San Diego, California. And as the biography of Banning on the Oklahoma Historical Website, Historical Society website notes, because of his color, this experienced pilot was not allowed to fly the plane in the air show. Instead, he had been only a passenger in a plane piloted by an aviation machinist mate, second class from the San Diego Naval Station. Banning is buried in Los Angeles, California. So Herman Banning, Cal Bibb, Cornelius Conant Bibb was getting a BS in electrical engineering. He graduated in 1925. He was born in Alton, Illinois in 1900, one of six children born to Scott Nathaniel Bibb, who had been born into slavery in Missouri, and Minnie L. Stokes Bibb. Now, what's interesting about Cal is that his family was the subject of a long fought battle to integrate black children into the white schools of Alton, Illinois. The case had been in the courts since 1897, before Cornelius or Cal was born, giving extensive national news coverage by, for Bibb's family. And when Scott Bibb died in 1909, leaving Minnie a widow, the family moved to Ottumwa, Iowa, leaving behind the rather troubled past in Alton and th those phenomenal efforts to get the students allowed in the white schools. Cal graduated from Ottumwa High School and came to Iowa State College where he lived in the Interstate Club with these other um, interesting gentlemen and eventually he took a job at the New York Transit Power Distribution Division as a machine operator and as a machine operator in a refining company. So he moved into the, the public sector employment as opposed to academic employment like Frederick Patterson had. Compton Chapman, who's up here on the screen on the far right, got his degree in civil engineering in 1926. Chapman is the only resident of Buxton, Iowa, to be among the students that we've discovered so far. And unfortunately, we haven't found out a lot about him, except that he was one of those 13 Black students who graduated with Juanita Ewing in 1926. He moved back to Des Moines, where he spent most of his life 
as a member of the Corinthian Baptist Church, working as a janitor for the Western Union Telegraph Company. Um, he later worked as a general contracting engineer in Des Moines. And that same year, 1935, he, along with a number of his Alpha Phi Alpha brothers and Interstate Club brothers, traveled to Tuskegee for the inauguration of Frederick Patterson as president of Tuskegee Institute. Um, at the end of his life, he was working at the Des Moines Water Works. Jimmy Fraser came from Charlotte, South Carolina. And his interest in mechanics took second seat to his electrical engineering interests until he left college and got a job. His employment after leaving Iowa State and graduating with his degree was in his own auto repair business in Charleston, South Carolina. He was also among those students who attended the inaugural banquet for the president of Tuskegee, Frederick Patterson in 1935. And not much is known of him other than the fact that he had his own auto repair shop, the Fraser Auto Repair Shop for quite a few years in Charleston. The other residents of the Interstate Club were students who studied agricultural subjects. Now this, you might say, does connect directly to Jack Trice. Jack was studying animal husbandry, just like Aubrey Aldridge and Jesse Otis. Frederick Patterson, who is in the middle of this photo, was getting his DVM when he would have met Jack Trice, but he later returned to receive an MS in agriculture. Agricultural education was the major of Lawrence Potts and Rufus Atwood. Now, what's interesting to me about these gentlemen is that at one time, Potts, Otis, and Atwood were all in the agriculture program at Prairie View University, now Prairie View A&M University in Texas. So there were five Iowa State alumni in that department, which was headed at the time by Edward Evans, who was another Iowa State alumnus who had inspired Frederick Patterson and others to come to Iowa State College. John Lockett is somewhat of an outlier. He was studying agronomy, but he actually was a soils microbiologist. So Lockett went on after Iowa State College, after studying soils here, he moved immediately to a position down at Prairie View. And then he moved again, not long after, to the agriculture program at Virginia State College for Negroes, which is now Virginia State University. He then received his PhD from Rutgers, working with Dr. Waxman, who was a renowned epidemiologist. And returned to Virginia State, where he continued to rise through the ranks, eventually heading the division of, of agriculture until 1963. So he was at Virginia State from 1928 to 1963. He built the program in agriculture from 11 students to 135 students at its peak. And he also was one of 12 American scientists invited to write a paper for the Russian Society for Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries after World War II. He prepared the paper for his research on biochemical transformation of certain organic matter in soils 
Sounds scintillating, doesn't it? His paper was sent to Moscow by the Friendship Committee and translated along with 11 other papers. He was also a charter member and later president of the Virginia State Credit Union. There's a building at Virginia State University named for him. He eventually returned home to Austin, Texas, where he passed away and is buried. I'm saving Frederick Patterson for last. So let's take a look at Jesse Otis. Jesse Rogers Delbert Otis was born in Carson, Mississippi on the 9th of July, 1899 to Delbert Otis and his wife, Anna Sims Otis, farmers. Jesse attended school in Piney Woods, Mississippi, and then in Three Oaks, Michigan, where he was the lone black student in a college of, or a class of 37. Now, what's interesting to me there is that in 1923, Jack and Cora had the opportunity to hear a singing group from Piney Woods School in Mississippi performing here in Ames. And again, I have no proof of this, but I assume that they probably went to hear the Piney Woods singers with their friend, Jesse Otis, who had graduated. Well, he actually hadn't graduated from there. He attended there before moving on to graduation in Michigan. He studied farming. He worked on farms in Michigan to um, pay his way. And at Iowa State, he studied animal husbandry, another connection to Jack. Again, I imagine Jack sitting down talking to Jesse Otis and to Aubrey Aldridge about their courses, moaning over the difficulty of their agronomy coursework. That's what all students seem to do, isn't it? It's, they sympathize with each other. Misery loves company. When he was at Iowa State College, he was active in the agricultural club on campus and also a member of the Alpha Nu chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha. In 1935, he also attended the inaugural banquet for Frederick Patterson, becoming president of Tuskegee Institute. And he eventually taught at Tuskegee himself. He started teaching there around 1928 when he left his teaching job at his former school, Piney Woods, where he had returned to teach. Every time I see Kathy moving, I think they've lost the sound again. We're still good. Okay. He stayed at Tuskegee for the next seven years, and in 1933, he earned his MS in Agriculture and Life Sciences from Cornell University. He eventually received his PhD in the same field in 1944, also from Cornell. Now, what is perhaps the most interesting about Jesse Otis and about Rufus Atwood and about Frederick Patterson is that they all became presidents of institutions of higher education. So Rufus Atwood was acting president at Prairie View and then he became president at Kentucky State and Jesse Otis became president of Alcorn State and Frederick Patterson of course became president at Tuskegee. All of those men were studying agriculture and living at the Interstate Club together. And Jesse Otis had the distinction at Alcorn State of uh, becoming embroiled in some racial protesting. He was serving as president at Alcorn State until 1957 when the Mississippi governor removed him from his post following a multi-week student boycott sparked by an Alcorn history professor who, quote, wrote a series of articles for the Jackson State Times linking the NAACP to communism and criticizing Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, unquote. Otis returned to Tuskegee after being removed from his position at Alcorn State to finish his career as the director of the School of Education there. And he's buried 
in Mobile, Alabama. Lawrence Potts earned his bachelor's degree in agricultural education from Iowa State in 1925. And while attending Iowa State, he was a member of the Alpha Nu chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha. After graduation, he worked as an itinerant teacher for the Agriculture Department of Prairie View Normal and Industrial College, now Prairie View A&M, before becoming the Director of Agriculture there. So he worked his way up to be a Director of Agriculture as well. Aubrey Aldridge went back to the Southwest. He was originally from California, and he married a woman named Winstona Hackett, who was from a very well-respected family in Phoenix. And her father was the first African-American physician in Phoenix. And Aldridge, who had been studying agricultural education, went back to teach at the public schools in Phoenix. He taught for years at Bethune Elementary School there. So again, entering education, but not in higher education as some of his house or apartment mates did. Now, I said I was saving Frederick Patterson, and that's because Frederick Patterson is perhaps the most distinguished of all of these men. I already told you something about him. And I'm, I want to give credit to Brad Kanan at the Iowa State Vet School, um, Veterinary College, because he is the one who is producing quite a bit of information on Frederick Patterson right now for the, the Patterson centenary. We're also experiencing the Jack Trice centennial right now. So this material comes from Brad, and I use it with gratitude. Frederick Patterson was born in the Anacostia neighborhood of Washington, D.C. in 1901, the youngest of six children born to William Ross and Mamie Brooks Patterson. Tragically, both of his parents would die from illness before Patterson turned two years old. When his oldest sister, Wilhelmina, graduated from the Washington Conservatory of Music sometime around 1908, she moved to Texas to start her career in music education and took young Frederick with her. She worked at several different schools in Texas and Oklahoma and used any extra money she had to pay for her brother's education. Eventually, she landed a job teaching music at Prairie View State Normal School and Industrial College, now Prairie View A&M University. And Patterson, who had been staying with relatives up to this point, moved in with her and enrolled at the school. One of the interesting threads that we want to pursue with our project is those connections to HBCUs, those historically black colleges and universities, the threads to Prairie View, the threads to Kentucky State, the threads to Alcorn State are, and to Tuskegee are many and deserve more focus than we can give them right now. Patterson, became interest in veterinary interested in veterinary medicine at Prairie View, and during his junior and senior years, he'd spent many hours with the young school veterinarian, Edward B. Evans, who had just earned his DVM from Iowa State College. He encountered Patterson, or he encouraged Patterson to pursue a career in veterinary medicine and recommended Iowa State to him. So Patterson arrived in Ames during the late summer of 1919 and enrolled at Iowa State. Four years later, in the spring of 1923, he had earned his DVM and, of course, had been a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, the Alpha New Chapter with Jack Trice, and lived at the Interstate Club. He moved on to Virginia State College and worked there for nearly five years. So he would have overlapped with the time that John Lockett was at Virginia State College. While at Virginia State, Patterson received a fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation General Education Board to pursue an advanced degree. 
He was granted leave from his teaching position and returned to Iowa State College to finish his MS in veterinary pathology in 1927. He returned to Virginia to take up his teaching role again, but was soon contacted by Tuskegee Institute about a teaching position there. He accepted the position to teach agriculture and animal science courses and also to act as the school's veterinarian. He was again offered a fellowship by the Rockefeller Foundation and was able to pursue his advanced degree at Cornell, completing his PhD in bacteriology in 1932. Shortly after returning to Tuskegee, the director of the agriculture division was murdered and Patterson was put in charge of the division. And then only a couple of years later, he was president of the institution. He also happens to have been, well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Let me try and stay on my slides. So I already told you about these men. Rufus Atwood was an impressive individual. And um, Rufus, I was at a conference last year at Clemson. And there was a colleague there from Kentucky State. And I said, oh, do you know who Rufus Atwood is? And she said, you know Rufus Atwood? And so I told her about Rufus Atwood. It turns out that Rufus Atwood is tremendously beloved at Kentucky State because he basically built the institution between 1929 and 1961. It went from being sort of a, um, a rundown, advanced high school to the institution that it is today. There's a Rufus Atwood building. They have a Rufus Atwood day. They have um, Rufus Atwood's oral histories. I'm going to make a pilgrimage to Kentucky State to learn more. But Rufus Atwood spent time also at Prairie View in the ag agricultural department there before becoming the acting president um, of Prairie View and then moving on to Kentucky State. So this group that was residing in the Interstate Club and Brothers of Jack Trice in Alpha Nu chapter of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity were impressive. There is Frederick Patterson. He was also the founder of the United Negro College Fund and the implementer of the Veterinary College and Commercial Pilots Program at Tuskegee, as well as creator of the Tuskegee Airmen. And well, I already talked about James Herman Banning making um, flying history. So what we find is that while a lot of the focus has been placed on Jack Trice, Jack Trice was swimming in a very rich pool of individuals. He was connected to men and women who went on to educate others, to lead institutions, to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom. The students that we have studied are some of the most committed students I have ever read about. The returning again and again after taking time off to work has led me to believe that Jack Trice was not alone in his commitment to education and to serving others. His dream was to go to the South and work with poor black farmers and help them to learn more about how to farm better. These men of Alpha New chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha, the men of the Interstate Club, Juanita Ewing, who went down South to teach in Alabama. All of them had a mission to serve others and to take what they learned at Iowa State College back with them. Even Cora May, who didn't finish her degree in home economics, spent the rest of her life as a homemaker. She used her education in home economics to build her own home. And she eventually remarried a man named Homer Green, and the Green family were kind enough to give me her graduation photo. I think most of you know the story of the, the stadium here 
and the fight for the naming of the stadium after Jack Trice. So Jack Trice continues to live on and his legacy continues to inspire. But I think we should also be inspired by those who he associated with at Iowa State College. Thank you. I didn't leave us much time for questions. Does anybody have any questions? We can. Linda, she's coming for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, were there any black um, V12 individuals who stayed like in the residence halls? I mean, they were run by the Navy at that point, but I just wondered if there were any black. Uh, I haven't, I have not found any, and my husband, who has done more research on the military takeover of, of the college, has not found any either. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that there weren't any, it just means that the records are hard to come by, so we may yet discover somebody. Casey, do you have any on Zoom or anything? Okay. Well, if nobody else has any questions, well, thank you, Gloria. And have you a wonderful easy. night, everybody. Thank you.